Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, chapter number 4. And then if you would, uh, we also want to look at a couple passages in 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy, chapter number 4. And then 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And I want to share a message with you tonight on a clear warning. A clear warning. In 1 Timothy chapter 4. And then in 2 Timothy chapter number 3. A clear warning. Hear what the Apostle Paul wrote to a young preacher as he tries to instruct him in the ministry. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. These are some of the doctrines that they'll teach. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. They're, they're going to imitate one thing, but it's not going to be what they're putting forth. Um, for a Christian to be a hypocrite, he would, he would have to act like the unsaved world. And for us to be hypocritical, we'd have to act like the lost. We are saved people. That's how we're to live as saved people. Well, for the unsaved, for them to be hypocritical, they have to try to imitate Christian living. And so Paul said they're going to be speaking lies in hypocrisies. They're going to be imitating that they're true, and yet they're, all, they're going to be false altogether. Then he says also, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And then notice in 2 Timothy chapter number 3 Paul says this know also that in the last days, so the Spirit speaks expressly in the latter days some shall depart from the faith. And as he takes on the second letter to the apostle, I mean to Timothy, Paul writes again, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. These are going to be dangerous days on the earth. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, that is, selfish, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those things that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to gather together. We're not just in this building, but in the name of Jesus, Lord, under the banner of the cross. Lord, to lift up the name of our Lord and our Savior, the soon coming King, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that you would help us. We know that you're mindful of all of our needs, but Lord, we beseech you and plead with you that you would just shower mercy upon us and give us great grace. Now, Lord, we are living in some difficult days ourselves and dangerous times, and we need your, your help, Lord, so that we would continue in the faith. We would do those things that would please you. Lord, we would not get caught up in this world and in sin. 
and get our eyes off of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, please speak to our hearts tonight and help us, Lord, to uh, to get in step with you and in your word. And, Lord, help our church that we might uh, be enabled by you to encourage one another, strengthen one another. Lord, help each other grow in grace. Lord, help our church to have a ministry where we can help believers mature. And Lord, we thank you for what you accomplished tonight in this service, for it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Well, I don't think that the Apostle Paul could be any clearer about what the Spirit, and that's a capital S, the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate to believers in these last days. Now, when you read the Bible, the truth is much, most of the Bible is plain to understand. I know you may not think that when you first hear that, but it, it's not as difficult as people that are unsaved or people that hate God, hate the Bible, claim that it is. A lot of it is really really simple love one another <laughs> love your neighbor love God I mean, it's, it's not that hard to understand a lot of it is plainly expressed to us so when God begins to shed some light on the last days uh, it's not in vain that he says the spirit wants to say plainly to you he wants you to clearly understand this. It, it's, it's with purpose that God is trying to teach us about some of the events that will be taking place in the last days, some of the atmosphere of the last days, some things that you and I should be on guard against and be preparing for, watching for. Uh, and, and this is one of the things that I hope that, that God will do in the, in the message tonight is give us a renewed desire to dig in of the Scriptures and study the Word of God and try to get a better understanding of what the truths are as God has given to, uh, them to us in His Word. Because I'm concerned that we don't have, and when I say we, I'm not just talking about us that are in this church tonight, but we as a church don't have a real good understanding of sound Bible doctrines. What does the Bible teach? And then we're able to communicate those things with others in a clear biblical way, verse, verse upon verse, line with line. This is clearly, plainly what the Bible teaches on this topic or that topic or any other topic. And so I think we're losing those clear definitions of what Bible doctrines are. Most people want to kind of muddy the water when it comes to doctrine today. Um, you'll hear people say strange things like this, doctrine divides. They'll say, well, you don't need to look at Bible doctrine because, you know, that kind of that kind of cuts people up and puts them in this guy in that corner and this one over here in that corner. That's not the purpose of Bible doctrine, is it? According to Ephesians chapter 4, it's so that we would all reach the unity of the faith. We would all grow up in that same like-mindedness. It's not division, it's unity. And then others would try to convince you, well, it's, you know, doctrine is really just hard to get your uh, mind around, Brother Tom. It's really deep stuff and would you listen to me just for a moment I think there needs to be a renewed effort on, in Christendom for a, some deep thinkers Amen. some people that are really look into biblical truth and put the work in to thinking through those truths so that we can help those that are coming behind us clearly understand what those truths are not just be uh, kind of passive that's what I want to stir us out of. Passive about biblical truths. Why, why is that the case for the Tommy? Well, we're warned to be aware, right? The Spirit said plainly, speaks expressly. I don't know how else he could say it clearly. You know? 
How, how else can the Spirit of God say to you, now I want to make this crystal clear. Wake up. Pay attention. Don't let this get by you. That in the last days, so now we've got to ask ourselves a question, are we in those days? Well, there's two ways to define the last days, and I'm not trying to confuse the subject. We know this. Jesus, when He entered into the world and died on the cross, He said this is is the last days. So we know that kind of defines the last days, Christ coming into the world, right? But now that's been nearly 2,000 years ago. And so now we know that we're getting closer and closer to the end of the world. We're not going to have the world as it is a lot longer. So we know that we're approaching the end of time, the last of the last days. As long as I can be, as long as I can remember being saved, I've heard preachers preach on the the second coming of Christ and the end of days and what's going to happen. What should we be looking for? And many of those signs that they told us to look for are right before us today, right? I mean. A lot of them it wouldn't take but just a moment and it would be functioning just like the Bible prophesied that it would be functioning. And there I'm thinking specifically of a global monetary system where you don't have dollar bills anymore, you just have a mark on your hand or your forehead and that's how you buy, sell, uh, buy and sell. So, I mean, we're close to that already. How many of you uh, don't have cash on you most of the time anyway? You just carry a little credit card, swipe the credit card. If somebody whips out a checkbook, you say, what is that? What are you writing in that thing there, and how does that even work? <laughs> That's what we used to do all the time. Now it seems to be like the dinosaur age, a check. Yeah, we do too. <laughs> I don't change too fast about that. But but we are certainly approaching nearer than ever before Christ's return. And the only reason I'm trying to get you to see what Paul was saying to Timothy is because the next thing he, he's going to say to him, you and I are going to face, or our children are going to face, and if it's not our, it may be our grandchildren or them, their children, they're going to face it when they're going to be, and we know it is clearly happening in our day, right? There is, there is already a great falling away. Now that, that means this, the fundamental, when I say fundamental, I don't mean, um, you know, these... Uh, people that carry guns and try to convert people to Christianity with a gun. That's not Christianity. I, I'm talking about people who firmly believe the truth of Bible doctrine and wouldn't waver on that truth. And many of our mainline denominations held firmly to biblical doctrine. Now those mainline denominations have fallen. They don't believe in Bible doctrine anymore. They don't believe in the things the Scriptures teach anymore. In fact, they are promoting things that are anti-Scripture. So, uh, even some of your great denominations are being affected by that and their numbers are getting smaller and smaller. Brother Phil said he read an article, was it online, Brother Phil? About how many churches close every year. And what was the number of those? It was between 60 and 100,000. 60 and 100,000 churches close every year. Stop and think about that. And so what's going on in America is the doctrines that, that the church is built on, those doctrines are being lost, and this is the next thing that's happening. Those that are in church today are not realizing that they're called to carry that gospel to the next generation. So what's going to happen if they fall off the scene? The gospel as, as, as we know it to be true in the Bible will not 
be preached any longer. And people are going to hear a gospel that has no power to convert the soul. So it's not just important that your preacher know doctrine, Bible doctrine. It's important that you get past the idea of just coming and listening to sermons and you realize, hey, I've got to study some of these things out myself. Um, I, I was talking to Brendan and Corey on the way over here tonight. We used to have a, a Bible institute here at the church that we had at 5 o'clock and I, I really thought that people were going to just love that. And we were going to be able to look at uh, the doctrine of the church and the doctrine of the family, the home, and and dig into a lot of major doctrines and really focus on those doctrines until we had a comprehensive understanding of those doctrines. And, and uh, it was a little, not a little, but greatly disappointing to me when the when it seemed there to be no desire for it. And I know that's not not the fault of all of us. I know you, many have busy schedules and like and such like, but that seems to be the overall atmosphere of the church today at large. We want entertainment, right? We would love to go someplace. If we had something, an event here tonight that was just like, wow, we would leave the church buzzing. Ooh, man, that was fascinating. How in the world they did that? Did you see that magic show? I wonder how he pulled that rabbit out of that hat. That was so cool. That's not what church is for, though. The church, is. we're here to, be, to hold truth in this generation. We are the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is. And if the church no longer preaches the truth, then the generation no longer hears the truth and it gets more and more corrupted because truth is lost and it's only maintained in the church. And so I want to, I want to just encourage you that you and I, when we read this passage, it should alarm us that, that we are in that day where strange doctrines are being taught. And by the way, you know, this is repeated throughout the Word of God, right? When Jesus was asked by the disciples, Lord, what's going to be a sign of your return? Remember that, Matthew chapter 24? And he warned them. He said, don't you go after these false Christ. There'll be wrong doctrine that's taught. And here Paul says, there's wrong doctrines taught in the name of Christianity. It's not not Bible doctrines at all. And how are you going to know the difference? I remember when I was a young Christian, I worked at Russell Corporation. They made designs on shirts and sweatshirts and, you know, no matter what it was, screen printing. And I worked with a, a, a guy there that was a, a Mormon. And I worked with a young lady there that was a Jehovah's Witness. And so, the, and I was, I just had been saved. I hadn't been saved long at all. And I went to the uh, Mormon and I said, well, tell me, in your religion, how do you, you guys get saved? I mean, I heard y'all were a cult. And so how do you get saved in the Mormon faith? He said, well, you have to believe on Jesus and get baptized. And I said, well, wait a minute. That kind of sounds like what they teach us at our church. Believe and get baptized. And so I went to the Jehovah's Witness and I said to her, I said, well, how do y'all get saved in your faith, you know? And she said, well, you have to believe on Jesus and get baptized. And I said, you know what? <laughs> and so I went to my pastor. And I said, Pastor, you said they, they're a cult. I've heard all my life they're a cult. Stay away from them. But I uh, asked them about what they believed and, and they both said, you had to believe on Christ and get baptized. And he said to me, he said, Tommy, the Jesus that they believe in is not the Jesus in the Bible. Yes, and do you know the Bible declares that they'll come and preach another Jesus? Yes. Paul warned us about those that preach another gospel. The gospel means good news. And he said in Galatians 1, 
It's not a gospel. What he's saying, it's not really good news. It's not a gospel at all. It's, it's news that's, that's kind of portraying itself to be good, but it will damn your soul to hell. And he said, if anybody preaches a gospel like that, an angel from heaven or anybody, let them be a curse. Let them be a sign to hell itself. Paul, why did you respond like that? Because what happens, it seduces men into believing into in a Christ that's not in the Bible. I've been listening some recently do some study on the Muslim faith. And if you talk to many Muslims, they'll say to you, well, we, we worship Jesus. We believe he's a great prophet. He's one of God's great prophets. And, you, and we believe in Mary, his mother. We believe he is virgin born. Uh, we, we believe he went ascended up into heaven. I mean, we believe a lot about Jesus. We, got, we, we have Jesus in our Koran. And you say, what? Y'all believe in Jesus? And then you start looking at the Jesus they believe in is not the Jesus of the Bible. Their Jesus didn't even die on a cross. God just made it appear like he died on the cross. Appear? So God, you kind of lied to everybody <laughs> and said, fooled you? And the only reason I say that is is the Muslim faith is creeping into England and creeping into America and they're creeping into the world and you're going to run into people and they're going to tell you, oh, we believe, you know, we're just a uniter. We believe in all of the religions and, and one God and we just want to bring everybody together under our umbrella though. You've got to come underneath the, the uh, Mormon, I mean the Muslim faith. <laughs> but it's not according to the Word of God. And it sounds... The reason I want you to understand, sounds good. But it's a seducing spirit. It's doctrines of demons. It's not the truth. And, it, and if you don't understand what the truth is, you're not even going to know you're being seduced away from Christ. And if you come away from Christ, then you come away from His promises of heaven. You come away from His eternal, that eternal home. Heaven itself, salvation. You can't have the Mormon Jesus and hold on to the Jesus of the Holy Scriptures. You see, the Mormon Jesus is the brother to Satan. They're brothers. Remember when Mitt Romney was running for president of the United States and they started talking about his uh, Mormon faith? And someone mentioned that, and boy, everybody just kind of, oh, don't talk about that. <laughs> if it's what you teach, why not? Let everybody know. Because it's deceitful. We don't want everybody to know that. By the way, do you know why they told me, believe on Jesus, get baptized? Because that's how they were taught to approach Christians. So that you gain their ear and you get them interested in it. And that's not what they believe at all. They believe you've got to work for heaven. You've got to be good enough yourself. They don't believe in the blood atonement for sin. They don't. But they make like they do, right? So, so you've got to be real careful. And I want to just stir your mind. Remember these verses, okay? 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil... As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith. 1 John 2.18, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. 1 Peter 1.13, wherefore... Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus even looked at Simon Peter. Simon Peter. Brother Phil was teaching this morning in Sunday school. He said there are three disciples that were close to Christ. Peter, James, and John. And out of those three... 
think Peter probably was, you know, kind of the lead guy. Everybody seemed to look to Peter. Peter went fishing. Everybody said, well, if you're going fishing, we're going fishing too. And so, here's Peter, and you know what? Jesus said to Peter and Luke, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Back in those days when they would go and harvest the wheat, they would put them on little uh, wire uh, baskets like and they would throw them up into the air and they would whisk it around and throw it up in the air. And every time they threw it in the air, the wind would blow the husk uh, away. And it, it, the, only the grain would be left after they finished sifting. And he said, you know what the devil's trying to do with you, Peter? He's trying to take away all that's good and leave nothing but emptiness left. Uh, left. He wants to take everything out of you that's good. But I prayed for you but that when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. And I just want you to understand something. Satan, if you think you could just sit in the pew and kind of just make it sail through your Christian life until you sail on into heaven... You are fooling yourself. Because Satan will try his best to take you out. He will try to deceive you. And the only way that you're going to be able to resist those attempts by Satan to, to deceive you is for you to personally become a student of the Word of God uh, if you need help in those areas, if you want to learn more, we'll do everything we can to help you, but the best thing to do is start picking up your Bible and comparing one verse with another verse. Look up the verses on baptism. and Start writing them down. Pray, pray over them and read them and memorize them and, and, and then you'll start having a good concept of what why is this doctrine there? What is the teaching of it? What's the purpose of it? So you'll not be deceived when people tell you that you have to be baptized to be saved. And you'll say, no! Baptism has nothing to do with whether or not my heart is changed and I have eternal life. That's just the next step of my Christian obedience. I don't get baptized to be saved. I get baptized because I am saved. Right? You say, preacher, how do you know that? Well, I know this. The thief died on the cross. He never got baptized. Right? He never even went to one church service. He never passed out a gospel tract. He never fed anybody that was hungry. He never did a good deed in his entire life. But when he died, he went to paradise with Christ. How is that even possible? Because he said, Lord, I believe on you. I know that you're innocent. You're dying for no reason at all. And Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And he said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Amen. He put his faith in Christ. By the way, that's the only way anybody's ever going to get to heaven. Trusting Jesus and Jesus only for your salvation. And so don't let anybody deceive you in this, in this area. Be on guard against deceptions from Satan. And by the way, there, there are multitudes. They're on the TV. Early in the morning, they're on the TV. They're on the TV late at night. And sometimes they'll say things, and they're on YouTube and all other places. And do I have all the answers? No. But I can promise you this. We'll open up the Bible and we'll see what God said about it. The reason I appreciate my pastor so much is when I came to him, he'd say, okay, Tommy, here's what the Bible says about it. Now go and read it. You got any questions? Come back. And then he'd give me another verse. And he'd say, all right, read that one. <laughs> and he didn't say, okay, I'm going to tell you what to believe and you're going to have to believe it because I tell you to believe it. I struggled with an issue as a, a young Christian. He said, well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to read this passage, these passages, and tell me what you think about it. And when I read them, it cleared up that topic for me. And it gave me a greater understanding. That's what the Bible taught. 
By the way, that's why I can stand on that doctrine today because I learned it not from Him, but I learned it from Christ, from Christ in His Scripture. So what I'm saying to you is I want you to be active. Christianity is an active faith. Do you hear me? It's an active faith. It's not a passive faith. It's an active faith. How many times do you read in the Word of God where it says, Do! I mean, get busy about it. Be active. Go! Is it an active faith? And you're going to have to be active about being prepared against the onslaught that's going to come at the end days. Do you know what the Bible says when the Antichrist appears? Do you know what it says? The Bible says for those that are going to be here, it, Jesus said, except I shorten those days, I would lose the very elect. It, it's going to be such a terrible day to live in, and His power is going to be so great that the, the enticement to go in His direction will be so strong, I've got to shorten those days down. How are you going to know this This guy that appears and starts working miracles isn't... And, and by the way, all Israel that's rejected your Jesus, they're going to bow before Him. And, and I guarantee you some Christians are going to think, Brother Phil, wait a minute. Did we get it right? I mean, look at all those passages that Israel's saying He's fulfilled now. I mean, look, the temple's being rebuilt. I mean, how could this be? If, they, if He's not the Christ... And Jesus warned us about those very things. And if you don't know it, you're going to be seduced by them. What's one of the Old Testament uh, things that happened that proved which God was the real God? Fire falling out of heaven, right? Guess what happens in Revelation chapter 13? Antichrist calls fire out of heaven. Do you think that they might just say, now let's see which one's real. Do you think that might happen? I think that might happen. And by the way, if you're here tonight and you've heard the gospel over and over and over again, you say, well, preacher, I, you know, I, don't, I just want to have my fun and I want to do my own thing. I'm not going to worry about getting saved until... You know, I'll reject the mark of the beast or sometime later on. I just, you know, I'll just be tough. I'll tough it out and I'll be... Guess what? If you reject Christ after you heard the gospel over and over again, He will allow you to be deceived. And you said, Preacher, where in the world do you get that? Well, I find that in First Thessalonians. Chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians 2, excuse me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Listen to these words. Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Perilous times shall come. The Spirit expe speaks expressly in the latter days. Some shall depart from the faith. Why? Because they gave heed. They gave an ear to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Even him who's coming, 2 Thessalonians 2 9, is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, listen, and had pleasure in unrighteousness. They said, I don't care. I want to live my life. I'll do my own thing. I'll... I'll have fun. I'll worry about that Jesus stuff later. And Jesus said, all right, then, then you're not going to be allowed to come. If you're going to reject my son so easily just so you can get some thrills, then you're going to have to suffer the consequences. By the way, that's eternal consequences. There is a real heaven. There's a real hell. And I'm just trying to help us all 
even in these last days when people are just deserting churches and, and falling away and they don't want Sunday nights, they don't want Wednesday nights, they don't want other times of Bible study. Let's cut it down to the bare bones, just get by, and let's have fun at church. That people are going to get in a world of, of hurt because they said, listen, I don't want to be just a student of Christ. And by the way, have, have you ever thought about what the word disciple means? Are you a disciple of Christ? Amen. That means he's your teacher. Amen. I mean, we've got to sit in his class and have an ear to hear to learn from him, right? Amen. And so what I want, to, I want to challenge you to do is, is to get involved with this effort of growing yourself and developing and becoming a, a doer of the Word of God, not just a hearer of the Word. Put, put biblical pr principles into practice. When, when Satan tempted Christ, how did Christ defeat the devil? He could have said, just leave. Right? He didn't do that, though. He said, now listen, children, I want to show you how you can defeat the devil. Let me give you an example of how to crush Satan. And Satan says to him when he is hungry, 40 days of fasting, starting to reach the point of starvation. He said, oh, you're hungry there, huh? Yeah, I'm hungry. He said, well, if you're God's son now, if you're God's son, you shouldn't be hungry. Doesn't God love you? I mean, He cares about you, right? Oh, yes, my Father cares about me. Well, you know, I don't see no stores around Jesus. No, I don't see any either. Well, how are you going to eat? I don't know. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you show us how that you're the Son of God and turn these stones into bread and then you'll have you something to eat there, Jesus. And Jesus said, Now, children, watch what I'm going to do now. I'm going to quote an Old Testament verse that you might not even think applies to this. But this is the power of the Word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. Satan said, oh no, i got problems here. He knows the Bible. <laughs> right? Amen. You know, there's a lot of people uh, that's just sitting out there and they kind of engage you in a conversation. And, and pretty quickly they know whether or not you are ignorant of the Word of God or whether or not you're well versed in the Word of God. And they know how to approach you then based on how you respond. Amen? Amen. And so he says, oh. He said, well, I, I, since you mentioned the Bible, Jesus, that kind of makes me remember verse. He said, if you dash your foot against the stone, the angels would come and just protect you. You know, won't you throw yourself down? Let's see that. Prove to everybody how powerful God is and how He can protect His children. And Jesus reaches back in the Old Testament again. He says, listen, the Bible says, God's Word said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Just because He's promised that He's going to do something don't mean that you should tempt Him. You just trust Him. Don't tempt Him. Trust Him. Well, I'll tell you what. Well, I know he loves the world. He came to die for the world. Amen. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show him all the kingdoms of the world that I now possess. And I'm going to say, Jesus, if you'll just bend the knee and worship me, I'll give you all of this. And he said, listen, reach back in that Old Testament again, didn't he? And he said, listen, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God only and serve him only. You're not worthy of worship. And then guess what the Bible says? Satan leaves him. And then it says, and the angels came and ministered unto him. He said, preacher, why do you mention that? Because if you don't get in the Word of God and study it yourself, when Satan comes to attack you, you're going to reach for something and not have anything to rebuke him with. Remember, again, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, who is the one building his house on a solid foundation? Now ask yourself a question. Are you building your life on a solid foundation or sinking sand? If you're not building it on doing what He says, it's sand. It's not a solid rock. 
The only way you can say, Preacher, I know I'm building my life on a solid foundation, and that's on Christ, is by doing what Jesus teaches us to do. Isn't that right? And over and over again, we're encouraged in the Word of God to obey Him. Listen to this verse. It's John 8, verse 31. And we'll come to a conclusion here. John 8, 31. I know y'all love it when we reset point, right? I like the Apostle Paul. He's preaching in the book of Acts and he preached well past midnight. <laughs> Fella fell out of the window and broke his neck. Don't do that here. You'll be in trouble. <laughs> Acts, I mean John chapter 8. Listen to this. Verse 31. And listen, please, just... If this last verse, I want you to consider what Christ said here. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. See, a true disciple continues in the word. Continues learning the word and growing in his understanding, developing. Listen, Understand biblical doctrine. You know, one of the evidence of spiritual immaturity, according to uh, Hebrews 5 and 6, is you don't even know the elementary truths of the Bible doctrine. How, how many, think about this, how many people would, if you call, you should be able to call on, hey, Jenny, come up here and teach us about the doctrine of repentance from dead works. And she should be able to come up here and say, well, this is what it is. You're saved by grace through faith. The law is not going to help you. You can keep everything in the law. And that's dead works. All the ritual, everything, sacrifice, all that. Do all of that that you can do. Guess what you got? Dead works. Repent from that. Don't trust in your works. Trust in His work. Oh, thank you, sister. I appreciate that. Now, Vicki, come up here and teach us about baptism. <laughs> or just point your finger at somebody and say, okay, you're next. Laying on his hands, you're next. Eternal judgment. These are the elementary truths. I mean, that ought to stir you and say, preacher, at least I ought to know that. You know, I, I got, I mean, if that's ABCs, I need, I need to know my ABCs at least. And then if you get into Hebrews 6, he's saying basically, how are we going to go past that if we don't get this first? And how can I help you to get there? I want to help you get there. I mean, that's a burden on my heart. I, I'd love to see you know the Word of God so well that when someone came and they twisted a passage, you said, oh, no, no, you can't twist that passage. That's not what the Bible says. Bible never said that. Jesus never said that. This is what he said. Oh. I'm not going to be able to trick you on that, am I? <laughs> but that's not going to happen until you get up in the morning and you know, open that Bible and do some writing yourself and thinking and preparing and studying. That's why I, li I like to see uh, people take a Sunday school class. I I'd love to see some of our young men take a class and even if they took the little boys and started trying to teach the little boys because when you study the Bible and try to communicate it to somebody else you, you've got to you've got to learn it well enough to try to get it over there and that helps you to try to get it to them you may know it but how are you going to communicate it and so it's good to, to take on a teaching role it's good to do that Amen? Amen? And I want to challenge you. We're coming into... And, and, and listen, you need, you need to be wise. We're coming in last days, seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. We're living in perilous times. And so you, you cannot just sit by and just twiddle your thumb and think that you're going to just skate through. No. I think that's our tendency in America, right? <laughs> we got to wake up. That's not going to be the reality. We need to get prepared... And get ready. Amen? Amen? So, wake up and listen to what 
God is saying to us. Right? Let's stand for prayer.